Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's workshop. Thanks for joining us. My name is Peter McKee. I'm a developer relations manager here at Docker. Um, and today we have uh, Jonah Jones, a solutions architect for containers from AWS on with us today. He's going to give a um, talk a little bit and then give us a really nice, awesome demo around AWS ECS integration. So, hey, Jonah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Peter. Uh, really excited to be here today. Yeah, great. Hey, tell everybody uh, what you do and kind of what you're going to talk about today, and then we'll just jump right in it. For sure, yeah. Um, so I'm a container solutions architect for partners, which is a fancy way of saying I work with all the amazing container container partners um, in our ecosystem, like Docker, uh, who's definitely one of our favorites. Um, and I get to do, uh, do cool stuff like make demos and, and work on product integrations with our container services. Um, awesome. And I am a, also from the Northeast area. So I've worked at a few startups before this and like SRE positions. And I'm a maintainer of a CNCF project called uh, Falco Security as well. So I like I do some open source work as well. Great. Awesome. When, whenever you're ready, take it away. Yeah, definitely. Um, so today, I didn't know I could do that with the Docker AWS ECS integration. Um, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about this, Peter, before I start diving in? Uh, what is this yeah. in case people don't know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we this partnership with um, AWS has been going on for a while. Um, and we want at Docker, we were trying to make it as simple as possible for developers, engineers, programmers, whatever kind of label you want to give them, help them easily move their code um, from either on their workstations, their development machines, and into the cloud. And so we partnered with uh, AWS and we targeted ECS um, to bring that integration. So the, you can use the, the Docker commands you know and love, the Docker Compose, but now you can target uh, ECS and deploy your workload straight into e ECS. Um, using a compose file. And uh, we just went GA, what, last week? Um, yep. And we got some really great features. Man, it's, it's like every time I pull um, the latest internally or on our edge, um, we're just getting more and more features. Um, so the way, the, the easiest way to get uh, the integration is to use Docker Desktop. You can go to docker.com and download uh, Desktop, either for Windows or Mac. And, um, just install, it's a very simple install. Then it'll install um, the engine and the CLI and the integration, and uh, you're all ready to go. Yeah, definitely. And if you have Docker Desktop, make sure you update it because like you mentioned, GA came out last week. And I spent about an hour trying to figure out why things wouldn't work last night before I realized I had to update it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. yeah. And there's two channels. So you can do the, uh, the stable channel, which we recommend, of course, for you know, production level builds of your images and those type of things. And then there's the edge version. The edge version is very, very stable in and of itself, but, um, you know, potentially things could not work. Um, but it's very easy to switch back and forth between them. Um, I just, at least on the Mac, that's what I'm running. So I just drag, download the edge, drag Docker into the trash and, and uh, install again. Um, and I can switch back and forth between stable and edge pretty easily. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I haven't checked out Edge a whole lot, but I always hear things get on Edge a little bit beforehand if you are a cutting edge, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. So this this is going to be recorded, right, Peter? Yes, it is recorded. Um, right. Um, by at least the end of the day, uh, you'll get an email. Everybody that's uh, registered should get an email with a link to the recording. So we know we're we're kind of in the middle of a work week, work day for folks, um, depending on where you're at in the world. So don't worry, uh, stick around for as long as you can, um, but you'll definitely get the recording. And even if you watch the full thing, of course, you can watch it again and um, go back over it. Yeah, definitely. Well, without further ado, uh, we can get into the fun stuff. So yesterday um, or a few days ago, when I started digging into um, you know what kind of demo I was gonna make, uh, volume just came out with the stable release. And so I thought it'd be cool to do something with volumes, you know, show off the power of volumes. So volumes is powered by our um, EFS or elastic file system. So behind the scenes, the EFS won't delete if there's an update. Um, and what it'll do is, so if version one is getting stopped, 
version two will mount the EFS volume. So it allows you to do stateful um, applications or containers, right? And so trying to think about, you know, everyone knows about Jenkins. That's kind of the go-to, you know, stateful application. But, um, you know, with our love of CNCF, we, there's another stateful application that's pretty popular called Grafana. So I thought it'd be pretty cool to do a, uh, a demo with Prometheus and Grafana and show how we can take a typical compose file and launch it straight into Fargate and how it'll work with volumes. So we are going to pray to the demo gods because this will be really fun if it works. <laughs> yep. And uh, so if anyone's not familiar with Docker Compose, this is a pretty standard Docker Compose file. There's actually nothing in here that is unique um, except the volumes. So right here, if you were going to do a typical Docker Compose, what you might do is you might actually call in uh, a relative path like this. Um, but what it's doing in EFS is it's, it's wanting to know the file system name. So we have to give it Grafana right here um, instead. So that's the only difference, but it's pretty much a Docker Compose file up and down, right? So what we're going to do um, is we're going to launch into it, and then we get, we'll get some time to talk while it spins up. So if you're not familiar with this, um, what it is doing is it's using a context behind the scene to decide where it launches. And so we have our Docker context LS here. And we can see that I have the default one, which is the Moby Docker type. And then the demo one, which is the ECS type. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, Peter. So why did you guys choose to use context? Yeah, so we were thinking of a way to be able to run your uh, the CLI, but point to another engine originally. So either running your uh, a Docker engine locally and um, on your local host, or running an engine in the cloud, let's say on uh, a standalone EC2 instance that you managed, or even a swarm cluster. Uh, so that was kind of the the, the uh, beginnings of a context. And then we grew that into uh, the meaning of a context, meaning just anywhere you, that supports running standard Docker containers and being able to manage those. And so that opened up the cloud to us. Um, and there's gonna be more coming with uh, context. But the idea is you uh, create a context, you tell it what type of context you want to create. So in this case, an ECS context. Um, and it'll walk you through the steps on how to set that up. Uh, yeah, and so the, so the main concept of a context is being able, is an environment that's able to run um, containers. And so whether that be in the cloud, a public cloud, a private cloud, or on your local machine. And then, you're, and then you can easily switch between those, which makes it super easy. Yeah, definitely. And uh, this has come a long way since the uh, initial beta release. Um, I created a context last night and it, you know, it shows you all your AWS profiles and you just, you know, pick one with the arrow keys. It's super, it was super slick. Yeah. Yeah. So without further ado, um, we're going to run Docker compose up, which is our classic command. The only difference is we're not running Docker dash compose. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit because I learned the history about this recently, actually. Yeah, I might I might not have the history correct, <laughs> be exact, but um, yeah, Docker compose was actually uh, came from an acquisition that Docker did, um, and we use it forever, and we we um, refactored it internally, um, and then it just didn't make sense to have two separate tools, right? Um, and so yep. following the, the Docker um, noun verb kind of command line structure was uh, made sense, right? It's to bring everything into one, one um, we call it DX, I guess the industry calls it DX too, one developer experience, right? Instead of like a UX, um, instead of having to switch back and forth between a couple different tools, uh, we wanted to bring everything into alignment and standardize on the Compose spec. Um, and so that's why you'll see us bringing more and more stuff into the Docker space compose. Um, and so that way you can run the exact same commands you would locally context as you can with the cloud. Yeah, definitely. And, and Chad was going to explain that exact same thing to me and I, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, I never realized it was an acquisition, acquisition originally, Docker compose, but yeah. that's cool. Yeah, hopefully so, I'm correct on that. I'm, I'm almost 99% positive on that. Now, now I'm second guessing myself. But yeah, I'm, it was a it was a um, 
it was an acquisition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think he said it was, and it was originally written in Python. Yep. Yeah, and we're um, yeah, and that, and that's another kind of you know drill into the compose. We wanted, yeah, it's originally written in Python. Current you know Docker Dash composes, and everything else is written in Go, right? And uses yep. the Go ecosystem, right? And so it was. They wanted to refactor it into use Go so we could fit into all our other tools and then be able to easily integrate it into the Docker CLI. Oh. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what we're looking at right here, um, and this takes a minute, which is why we were kind of chatting, is um, so this is the Docker Compose running cloud formation behind the scenes. So it takes this Docker Compose and it converts it to cloud formation and it's launching it. So if I went to my CloudFormation console, I should see this exact same uh, UI here or similar, right? So if we went up to my Meetup demo right here, we can see that it has created a bunch of stuff. It takes a little bit to make the load balancer, which is why we're trying to talk a little bit about history here. Um, and that's a prerequisite to making services. I think I had a plugin that's up there. Um, so yeah, so, and it's making an EFS um, file system with EFS mount targets, which is gonna be what our Grafana is using for the persistent storage. Um, and then I, I think I'm just scrolling, which it doesn't like to do, me to do. Um, so I apologize there about the reloads. Um, but yeah, this is super handy. I, I love the, um, the little numbers on the side here too. Yeah, it gives you a count. Yeah, I like how it, and it kind of lines up to, like you're showing, you can come into the console and see exactly what's what's going on, what's what, everything it's doing behind the scenes, you can see in the console how it's building it, and what's being built, what resources are being spun up for you. Yeah, yeah, and so the, the way that, so this is a launching a public service as well, um, because we defined it, you know, not as private, and so I think because we defined these ports, here with 3000 and 9090. I think that these are going to be publicly accessible from the internet, right? That's right. Yeah. This awesome. So this is going to launch Grafana and Prometheus and their own Fargate tasks with Cloud Map, which is doing our, our service discovery so that we can hopefully uh, have them talk to each other and then have a load balancer so we can come in and, and hit this and uh, show what's going on. Yeah, we got to We got to. Uh, I'll answer this question now while we're while we're chatting and waiting for things to spin up. So, uh, Docker test does Docker desktop work on an M1 Mac yet? Uh, it does not currently right now. It has to do with some of the subsystems and the way we do um, uh, virtual machines underneath the hood. And uh, but we're working on it. We've been working with Apple. Um, you should. Uh, we don't have an exact date when we'll drop but um, we're actively working on it, working with closely with Apple. Um, so it should be it should be soon. We actually, um, when the M1 chip came out, um, our roadmap, which is on GitHub, so github.com uh, forward slash docker forward slash roadmap, we had, a, and that's our public roadmap. We had an issue out there, um, you know, to have uh, desktop run on M1s. And uh, as soon as the, as soon as Apple dropped the new hardware, that that issue rose to the top, just soared to the top. People people wanted it, um, so we actually shifted what we were doing internally to put uh, more resources against it and deliver that quicker. So it's coming, it's it's coming. Hang in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Christmas is soon, right? We put it on our wish list. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the service is launched. Um, and one of the really cool things I like about this tool is the ability to, that it, like the way it runs logs. Um, and so if anyone's familiar with Docker Compose, you get streaming logs after you run. Um, and they were actually able to simulate that UX experience here, um, even though the logs are in CloudWatch. So what we can do is we can run Docker Compose logs, I believe. And we can actually see, and they're, they're labeling it like, you know, Prometheus or Grafana, but we get logs in the exact same fashion that we're used to for Docker Compose, but these are coming from CloudWatch and they're saved for long-term storage retention. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, this is probably my favorite thing. <laughs> I love seeing this screen. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, it, it makes it so easy instead of, um, yeah, digging through uh, the console to find longs. Yep. Awesome. So now that we have this, we, uh, I was kind of giving it a minute because once you launch a load balancer, it takes a minute for the DNS to start resolving. Um, another great feature about DNS. So we're going to try this DNS name here now that it's launched and we're going to try to go in and see if we can get this configured. So I believe we just do port 3000. And looks like we have Grafana. Well, that's nice. awesome. So we're going to log in here. So if you have used Grafana before, you know that you have the almighty admin admin as your base login. And we keep it the same. I'm not going to write a new password for now. Um, and so we have Grafana, and this is our one with the file system, and we have another Prometheus container. So I want to hook these two up. So what you have to do in Grafana is you actually have to go configure a data source. Um, and here, oh, looks like it's using an old file system I had, so let's delete that. It looks like I, uh, when I was testing this earlier, I must have kept my EFS running. So we are going to go add a new data source here, and I actually will use Cloud Map to find what the address I want to write in here is. So I called this one Meetup Local. And then we have the service of Prometheus. And so what this will look like is it's going to be prometheus.meetup.local port 9090. We're going to go add that data source here. So we want HTTP prometheus.meetup.local colon 9090. And what that will do is that should address directly to the other Fargate task without having to go back through the load balancer. So this is a lot more direct path and it's also a lot cheaper this way, right? Um, I could obviously use this load balancer URL and then, so like, I will show you both ways here. So I could do it this way, right? So save and test. So it says that the, the data source is working, but I also could take this load balancer URL if I really felt like it. And I could put the exact same thing in, but at coming in at uh, 9090, because our load balancer will will take 9090 and direct that to the um, to the Prometheus. So this one also works, right? But we want to save that lookup, so we're going to use the uh, the first one here. So we got Prometheus Meetup Local 9090, save and test. Let's go add some dashboards. We'll go delete all these. And we're going to add Prometheus Stats 2.0, because I think this one is the really advanced stats. And we'll, we'll take a look at this. So here we can see that we're getting some data from Prometheus. Um, and if you've used Prometheus and Grafana, right, to get anything super special, you have to set up your Prometheus configuration. Um, and you would set that up with scrape targets, like through exporters. We don't have any of that configured. So we're just going to prove out that we're getting Prometheus working and that we're getting Grafana with persistent storage for now. So what I'll do is I'm going to update this to five minutes default, and I'm going to save the dashboard here. And what this is going to do is when I launch a new Grafana task later, hopefully if it imports this file system, we get this dashboard saved and, and all our data source saved. So we can come in here. So we're going to overwrite. So now if I go back here and I went to Prometheus 2.0, I should see that all my data is here and then it says last five minutes. All right, so now here's the fun part. We are going to, um, We're going to update this task here. So when you run Docker Compose up again, it's going to run a stack update. And what it's going to do is it's going to launch a new task definition version. And it's going to have this environment variable, which is GF users allow sign up equals false. So we look here at the Grafana configuration. We can take any of these attributes and you basically are doing GF, then the category, then the attribute. And so we're going to set this to false. 
And so our new task will be able to see this task definition and it will disallow user sign up. And then we should be able to log in and see that our all of our configurations are still there, even on the new task, right? So let's run that. We can cheat a little bit too here and uh, try to get this up faster, but. Um, oh, sorry, I'm running in um, this one. So, we'll, which I guess I already set that. So what I'll do is I'll remove it on this one. I had uh, I had two files, two paths going. So I was actually running in the meetup demo path there. So again, the demo gods are coming out today. <laughs> yeah. So now we're gonna run Docker Compose up. So we deleted the environment variable. So now actually let's prove out that if we take a look at this task, we should see that it now that this one actually had the environment variable here. So we see that it was working. And so what we'll do is we're gonna delete it. The new task won't have it, which is definitely gonna prove out it's a new task. Um, but we should still see that the file system is working behind the scenes here. So I run Docker Compose up. It's taking a minute to figure out the diff here, but it should send it to our cloud formation. We can see that the update is in progress here. So it kind of kicked off the new update here and we are updating our task definition. Cool. We have yeah. some, uh, we have some uh, questions while it runs. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, cool. So Max was asking, um, Max uh, Zabaleta, and the only reason I can pronounce that that, that last name is because that was a uh, uh, the last name of an old business partner of mine. Uh, still good friends with him. But anyways, <laughs> uh, so how to change the context to AWS? So yeah, so on the on the command line, uh, underneath um, once this runs, maybe um, Jonah can show us, or or if you can maybe in another terminal, but you won't be able to switch. I don't think. But you can do a Docker context, uh, and if you do a dash dash help, it'll show you everything you can do. But you basically have a, a, a use command, so Docker context use, and then you give it the name of the context you want to use. Um, yeah. And then yeah. when you use that, that, that's how you switch back and forth. It's it's really that easy. Exactly. So in fact, if you're running this locally, right, what you have to do, and I wrote this in my make file, um, is you have to switch to context. So like if I was going to run this locally, I would do Docker context use default. Because I want to use the uh, the you know the the, the host base on my Mac, and then I want to switch it to the the different context when I want to launch into AWS. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I like that. We're uh, we're also if anybody internally we're we're having discussions or like I mentioned so earlier around the DX, um, so this development uh, experience and workflow. And just like Jonah showed, a, we found that a lot of folks are using make files or some bash scripts, those type of things, to do those type of things, switching between contexts, um, swapping out environment variables that are in your composed files uh, for the different context environments you're running in. Um, yep. So it, I would love to talk to any developers out there that are using Docker um, pretty heavily and switching back and forth and and have developed some make files, some complex make files. and or bash scripts. Um, if you have something like that and you're willing to chat, hit me up on Twitter, uh, send me a DM or just you know directly tweet at me. I'd love to chat with you and, and see how you're doing things and maybe um, glean some some information from you um, so we can make our, our DX a little bit better. But yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it's one of the things that we know um, we need to address. There's some little little conveniences, right, that it would be nice that just, just work a little bit more seamlessly. But, um, but you know, as engineers and developers and solutions architects, we love our, we love our bash scripts and our make files too, so. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Yeah, okay, do we, so, have, uh, do we have time for a couple more or is it up? Okay, it's up. Yeah, I'm gonna do the little cheating method here. Um, so okay. what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this task three, which is our old task, I'm gonna hit stop. Um, because what it, if I don't do that, it's going to do a load balancer drain, which is like a deep, another five minutes waiting. So I'm going to hit stop and then we can answer a few more questions just to, so we can guarantee that we uh, get the new task running here. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Nicholas asks, um, 
can I switch existing project from ECS-CLI to Docker Compose with the ECS context? Um, not exactly sure what you're asking there. Maybe you can clarify a little bit for me, but so not all Compose, so running uh, Docker Compose, lo Docker Space Compose locally um, is not a feature yet. So you still, if you're running, if you want to run Compose locally, you still have to use Docker-Compose, but it's coming, it's coming shortly. Um, and then, yeah, we just kind of talked about how you switch context back and forth. Yeah, um, so e ECS CLI is an, uh, an older project that was originally kind of doing uh, what go. this is meant to do. Um, I don't know if it's still being supported. We would recommend you, you switch over to this. I don't know if there is a one-to-one -one path that will work right away, um, but there is actually support for local mode in this as well. Um, and so they have a local simulation mode as well. So, so, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, John. Yeah, t talk a little bit about that. That was that's. I haven't used the local mode uh, that much, but yeah, it looks very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So all I know about the local mode is it's meant if you're developing a cloud native application, and what it can do is it allows the AWS SDK to use your AWS credentials locally to simulate calls, right? So this might be really good if you have an application that's using an SQSQ or an S3 bucket, right? And you want to double check that these, the role you're going to launch is going to work, right? You can assume the role locally. Um, you can have a context hooked up to use that role, and then you could you do the local simulation. Um, and this allows you to see if it's going to like access the cloud services correctly. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, that's what I understood also. Cool. Yep. Um, uh, Fergus, so Docker Compose Up, command, command Compose Up is not available in the current context default. Yeah, that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, the Compose Docker Space Compose Space Up, when you're pointing to your local uh, Mobi instance, your local default context, uh, yeah, those those commands aren't available yet. You'll have to use Docker Dash Compose. Um, yep. Are we yeah. up and running yet? Do I have one more? All right. Uh, you are, you're welcome to do one more. I think we're good. So if we take a look here, we can see that the, uh, the task is stopped, right? Um, but yeah, we can hit up another question. Okay, cool. Um, Jose Estrada is asking, is there a potential to use Terraform instead of cloud formation in the future? Um, yeah, we, we're talking about that, right, is to have other, um, export formats right so right now we use cloud formation um but yeah so to be able to and the idea there too and, and jenna was talking about a little bit earlier is uh we talk a lot about the abstraction layers right so great technology uh gives you great abstractions right and that's what we're trying to achieve here is to get a a higher abstraction above um ECS in the cloud AWS in general right but still allowing you to drop down that abstraction layer and work as low as you need to and uh, yep. so that's why we use in cloud formation and that's why we can export it and you can modify that as much as you want but yeah if yeah. you uh and i'll give a plug for our roadmap one more time so go to github i'll put it in i'll type it in the answer but go to github.com forward slash docker forward slash roadmap and i believe we have a terraform issue in there if we don't Jose, uh, create one and, and tell us exactly what you're looking for, kind of your scenario, upvote it, tell your friends so they upvote it, and uh, and that'll help get it on our roadmap quicker. Yeah, definitely. I know that this uses Go Formation, the, the Go library under the scenes, and I'm not sure if there is a, a relevant equivalent for Terraform that would, you know, allow you to write uh, constructs in Go and, and then natively uh, output Terraform, right? Right. That would, right. That would be a good question. Um, I would love to see EKS support. That would be my that would be my number one thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me me too. Me too. That would be super cool. Super cool. Yeah. yeah definitely. I know that's also an issue on there, so I, that's only why I plug that. Yeah. <laughs> go 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 upvote it. <laughs> yeah. Um so so there, just to make sure that we're gonna Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, 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 I was just gonna uh, ask you a question. Yeah, you can do one more question here and then we will we will go double check and see if this worked. Okay, awesome. Is there a good way to estimate costs 
with this kind of compose driven infrastructure spin up? And then does the compose down command accurately and entirely destroy all the resources created in all costs associated? That's from uh, Dan. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a great way to estimate your costs, um, but we did choose uh, Fargate for that. I think maybe maybe it, maybe it's um, you know implicit in your question to to you know there there's a concern that you can spin up compose all over the place and you're going to be in certain current costs that you you didn't think you would 100 percent right you have to be have to be aware of what resources are being spin, spun up and how much they cost obviously. Um, but Fargate, nice with Fargate, uh, instead of running uh, full EC2 instances under ECS, is when you spin down those resources, um, you're not charged for them. So we wanted a good way to uh, a low barrier uh, to entry. So you can spin up your Compose using Fargate. Um, when you bring that down, then those costs go away. Um, yep. But yeah, yeah, it's a really good idea to understand exactly wh what resources are getting created what will what will um when you do a compose down what won't be uh torn down for example like your volumes because you want those to be able to persist um and make sure you plan accordingly for for your costs yeah yeah no that's a that's a great point um so by default they're using pretty small task sizes um so like we don't set we didn't set anything in our compose but they're using a 256 cpu and, and 512 ram um Right, and so if you think about this, both of these tasks together are about equal to equal, equal to like a micro T2 or micro T3 instance. I mean, Fargate has the same pricing model as on-demand EC2 instances. So um, probably the majority of the cost we're seeing here would be from the load balancer. Um, but but the Fargate is trying to run minimal for you because it you know it is used a lot of times for POCs, demos, and stuff out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so what we're going to do is to make sure that we're not getting any session cheating here. We're going to go launch this in an incognito window as well, um, just to make sure that everything is going to work. So we're going to try this. Um, and so what we have is we have our new task. So we will show that this is task four, and I definitely removed the environment variable. So if we take a look at the task, we should see that it no longer has that. Um, and so this is our new task. Right, so we don't see any environment variables. I removed it from the file. Um, however, when I log in, I should see all the changes I had made on my other one because it is mounting the exact same file system or EFS that was created. So everything should look exactly how I left it off here. So this is really awesome if I want to make updates, but I don't want to lose all the work I was doing. Yeah. Um, and so here's, here's where I pray to the demo gods. So we do see Prometheus <laughs> 2.0 stat. And does it work? And it's working. Well, our five minute config we saved. So that is proving out that our EFS file system is working behind the scenes um, because we have an entirely new container up and running and it saved all the, the, the changes we made. Um, nice. Yeah, and look, our data source is still configured here, the Prometheus meetup demo dot local and everything. So that's awesome. Um, I know. That was the demo. I wish there was something I could go send out for people to click. I'm not that creative to make something, but um, hopefully I can post this up on, up on GitHub. And if anyone's interested, uh, this might be a nice way for people to try out Grafana and Prometheus and, and make some editations really quick. I know it's a little bit frustrating when you're working on these, constantly having to reload your, you know, your Prometheus config file and et cetera, right? So this might be a, yeah. a, a quicker way to change some stuff. Yeah, that's it's super cool. I mean, um, to do this from scratch would be um, a magnitude more work, right? To set all this up, set up your load balancer, set up your um, your targets and and um, your cloud map and logging and and everything. It's it's um it's a lot of work. And just using a compose file that you're using locally with a couple minor changes, I mean, it's huge. At least in my uh, potentially biased opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, if you launching these on on Fargate themselves is no trivial task, but with the file system, it is is definitely difficult. And this is twenty lines of uh, of YAML, so yeah, yeah. Although it is YAML, the 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 mm -hmm. language of the cloud. I'm not, I'm not a super <laughs> fan, but it's everywhere, right? 
Um, but you know, I said that about Jason when Jason was coming around first too, and then I then I grew to love it. Um, yeah. And yeah, if cool. you uh, if you want to like, let's say you want to be able to have a control of the cloud formation, you can use this command, which is it's pretty helpful. Um, so it'll actually take this and give you out the cloud formation yourself. So you can go launch it. But let's say I want to change, you know, a certain variable or the task, right, or the memory or the CPU. This would be an easy way I could uh, get out my cloud formation and I could up those values and, and launch it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can see exactly what's being produced um, and what's being run. Yeah. No, there's uh, a lot of. Okay. I, I was just going to say, no, not, not a whole lot of secret magic, uh, you know, magic. The magic sauce is in uh, producing this cloud formation. Yeah, I think one of the most impressive things to me is the uh, the service discovery. So if you use Docker Compose, one of the nicest pieces of it is that I can um, I can address things by their Docker name, right? Like if I need to call Prometheus in my app, I can just call Prometheus colon 9090, right? When I'm writing the, you know, in the other application code. Um, and it yeah. gets really tricky because once you launch an ECS task, they now get like some random DNS name and there's a load balancer in front of them. Um, and so this like, it's using DNS service discovery and cloud map behind the scenes to make sure that those Docker Compose routes are the exact same thing that they can address each other in the cloud. I mean, I think that's super impressive. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's one of the it's one of the uh, the networking with Compose is, is is nice service discovery. Yeah, yeah, and mimicking it is not easy on ECS. So that like the fact that it works and you don't have to think about it, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, cool, awesome. Well, that's what I had for the demo. Um, definitely, we're here to ask or answer any questions if you guys have them. Yeah, we we got a bunch here. So let me I'll roll down through them. So that I'll. Uh, I'll take the easy ones and I'll send you the hard ones, Jonah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we have one from, uh, and please forgive me, everybody, if I pronounce your names incorrectly. Um, so is it safe, reliable to use this approach to launch production loads on ECS? That's from uh, Thabit. Uh, Jonah, you wanna, you wanna tackle that one? Yes, sure. So. Prior to the GA stable release, um, the answer we were saying was no. But with all the features that um, have come out, we do believe that it is production ready. And when we say production ready, obviously, a container that is meant to run in production on Fargate. So there are some stipulations, right? Like you can't run a UDP or a batch job. But with features like auto scaling, um, rolling deployments, uh, getting secrets from secrets managers, we believe that on the security level and on the um, you know the production ready level as far as scaling goes that it is ready. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, cool. Uh, Justin asked, once you make a compose file for an ECS context, can you still switch back to using your local Docker context and use the same compose file? Yes, 100%. Um, yep. There, there's some minor. Uh, extensions that that are added to the compose spec for specifically for the cloud those will get ignored locally um yep so yes you, the, the, go go ahead john go ahead. oh yeah i was gonna say that um that was the only thing i ran into was volumes that were different um but like i mentioned earlier the you know, i could get this running locally like this or if i just didn't use volumes altogether this would work just with uh, local docker compose like if I just did it like that, it would work 100%. Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, let's see, we've got another one from Nicholas. Are all features from ECS-CLI already ported to the Docker Compose, like target groups? I'm not as familiar with the ECS-CLI. I actually, in the earlier question, forgot that that was a, uh, an ECS tool, uh, an AWS-CLI tool. So I'll kick, I'll kick that one over to you, Jonah. Yeah, so... When you say all the features, uh, you might have to ask like a follow up as to what you're saying, but this is doing a lot of things behind the scenes for you. And one of those is that it's creating the listener and the target group for you. Um, so you may not get the granularity to 
do certain things in your target group, like change the um, like delay or the or the health check path, but it is creating a target group for you. And if you need to add those custom things, then we recommend using the uh, the Docker Compose convert and writing those in the cloud formation yourself. But if we did take a look, so if we pipe out the Docker Compose convert out into a YAML file, right? So we can definitely see that it is launching target groups for me here. And I can find those and I can go change those, right? So we can see that we have this target group being launched for Grafana. And we can see all the things it's creating and we could go add any customizations we would want. Yeah, cool. Okay, got another one, another one from Nicholas. Uh, you're using addressing um, from the cloud map for service discovery. Could you also use a Docker service name like in classic Docker Compose? Yes, and, and I think we I think we addressed that earlier. But yeah, that that's the that's the uh, the awesome thing we were talking about earlier, um, where you can just uh, like Jonah was saying, if you're in let's say the Grafana app and you need to address Prometheus, you can do Prometheus colon ninety ninety, um, and the cloud map magic happens just like it works with Compose. Yeah, super cool, very cool. Um, yeah. Yep. And in fact, I think the first demo for our blog post with Nginx and Redis, and that, it was either you or Chad that did it. They just used Redis 80 um, or, or whatever the Redis port was, and it definitely worked. Cool. 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 Okay. Let me, um, folks are answering questions that I asked when I was writing the question, but I forget. Um, so let me come back to that. Okay. So this one's from uh, Jose. I see that doc. Uh, I see that cluster VPC and load balancer can be specified within the Docker Compose file, but is there a way to specify the associated target group you want to route uh, to the task? I think that's kind of what you what you were talking about, Jonah. Of, yeah, um, so it it does create the target group for you. I don't think you can bring in your own, um, but you can you can always go edit the cloud formation yourself. Right. Yeah, I believe that's that's what you would have to do that currently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Noshad, uh, just a question on Docker, the executable. Is there a URL to compile and build this? I'm trying this out on a Raspberry Pi. So I was oh. needing to do that. Interesting. Um, and so are you talking about running uh, Raspberry Pi on, uh, I'm sorry, running Docker on Raspberry Pi? I know for sure you can do that. Um, depends on what what exactly you're doing. You know, devil's in the details, of course. But um, there's a Docker captain, uh, Ajit, uh, who does a lot of uh, uh, IoT stuff, and he has he has a bunch of great um, blog posts. I will go I will go dig them up in a minute here, and if I can't get it on the um, uh, on on the call here today, then I will I will have see if we can send it out in the resource. Um, but yes, you absolutely can for sure. Um, uh, Mithin Patel, does it support ECR as of today? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, so we can go take a look at the ECR support. There's a few ways to do this. Um, wherever the ECR images are down here. <laughs> I just control yeah. search. These docs are so good. I just go look through them always. Oh, they're great. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. Um, um, and too, while, while Jonah's looking for that, if anybody, you know, a great way to get involved with open source is to help out with docs. So if you want to get started with uh, Docker open source, jump into our docs, create a PR, just even fixing um, minor copy edits, spelling, those type of things is a huge help. And then it also, um, you start reading the docs and it gets more information into your brain uh, to understand it. So when you do go to the code, you kind of understand how everything works, so. Yeah, so what you have to do is um, with ECR, you have to basically create your, if you've ever done an ECR login, you see like you get this like giant block of text that's your like your login token. Um, and so it, it supports this X AWS pull credential secret so and i've done this before you create a secret with that login token and then you can just call the ecr image here 
Yeah. Um, and so that's how you hook it up with ECR. Yep. Or Docker or Docker Hub here. Like if you have a Docker Hub access token. Yeah. Yep. And you can um, you can actually create those secrets on the command line using uh, Docker Compose. Um, yep. And so you so you don't have to go into the the console um, and those type of things. You can actually create it uh, using the CLI, uh, which is super cool. So if you have yeah. um, username and password, those type of things, to be able to access, uh, you know, like Jonah mentioned, a private uh, hub repo. You can create a secret. You'll get back your ARN, and then you can plug that right into your compose. Cool. Exactly. Yep. So yeah, here you can see here they're providing like one where they they say what the secret is, and here they're just saying use the secret that already exists. So you can do either of the methods. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, no, no worries, Max. Your your uh, your English is fine. It is way better than my any other uh, international language: Spanish, French, Italian, anything. So your English is fine. Totally understood you. Uh, he was just apologizing for his English. Not a problem at all. Okay, so we've got a question from Juan Carlos. Um, how do you select a launch type, either Fargate or EC2 instance, when running your YAML Docker Compose? I I have not. I'm going to kick this over to you, Jonah. I have not used EC2 instances yet. Using our integration, I've only used Fargate, um, just because it's super easy for me and spin things up, spin them back down. I don't have to worry about if I miss something, but I'm not actually running anything on it, incurring uh, a bunch of costs. But yeah. So I believe that it's not currently supported in the stable release, but it is something that is being worked on. Um, so I can't, yeah, I don't. I don't know if there's a, a way to do it at the moment. Um, you might have to go check an edge to double check to see if that's around or not. Yeah, as, as I was talking, I, I couldn't I couldn't remember myself if we've uh, released that yet, even on edge. If it's not there, I'll, I'll double check and I'll let, um, maybe I'll tweet out, but um, I'm pretty sure it's not. And um, yeah, I, I have not used it that much, but I know they're definitely, uh, definitely working on it, the engineering team. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the good use cases for that is a GPU and ARM, right? Like that's yes. definitely an EDC yeah. for those. Mm-hmm. 100%, 100%. Okay, let's see. Um, Narishma, uh, any IDE, IDE plugin for local simulation? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the VS Code um, has a plugin. I know they they have a plugin that will work with context, um, but I don't think it supports uh, AWS local simulation right now in the ID. I could be wrong, Jonah. Do you have you seen anything? I don't. I don't know of anything like that. I believe that there's probably some community things that are um, you know trying to do that, but you know the the fact that standard has always been kind of Docker composed for local simulation. I know they, yeah. they've released some plugins for like Lambda and some other things, but it's just because there's not a good alternative like Docker Compose for those. Right, yep. Okay, Dylan asks, what is the Git, uh, what's the GitHub where this will be? Um, I think he's talking about your your uh, project you got here that you're demoing. Are you gonna push that up to, uh, to GitHub and make that available yeah. by chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can. Um, let, let me double check with you, Peter, and see if I can push it to the examples repository and your guys' GitHub. And if not, um, awesome. I'll push it to my GitHub. If, if that's okay, right. awesome. But, uh, awesome. But yeah, I we can send out the link after. Um, Perfect. And my Perfect. my GitHub is right here, and then the Docker ECS CLI GitHub is. This is the old one, the new, so it's on Docker Compose CLI. So if I can get it into this, yeah. to the ex, an example here, maybe I will try to upload it onto this one first. Perfect. If Perfect. not, it will go to the Jonah Jones repo. Okay, awesome. Uh, when I ask questions about you feeding an elephant, we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so Nicholas asks, can I change the cluster name at creation? By default, it's the first the folder name. You want to grab that uh, one, Jonah? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way to actually change it. 
it is folder name um, besides doing the method with the, the cloud formation that I mentioned. Well, you can, um, there's a dash dash project flag with, um, mm -hmm. with the compose. Um, okay. So you, yeah, so you, so you can change it. Yeah, there's a uh, project name. Yeah, so yes, by default, it'll use your folder name, the directory name that you're sitting in. Um, but yeah, you, you can change it um, and tell it the project name you wanna use. The only thing uh, that me that I personally don't uh, like is that every time you run a command after that, you have to tell it the project name that it's associated with. So, and I'm lazy. It's just it's just more typing. Um, mm. But yeah, it it does make it nice. So, because I know uh, if you're like me, the way I name folders and stuff is not how I necessarily want my cro my project to be to be up in the cloud. So, but yeah, so that's the way you change it. You use the dash dash project dash name. And that'll set that'll set the project for you. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in there that, that I, like I said earlier, just the, the features just keep coming and coming. It's hard for me to keep up with the, everything here, at Docker. But yeah, I know that the volumes are actually listed in here too, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. That's another. Yeah. So you can see all the yep. failed file systems from my demos earlier, but I. I can remove it directly from the command line um, if it gets stuck around here. Because um, I know in CloudFormation, they're not deleting them, right? Because they don't want to lose that data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. You can also, um, I think you could do secrets. Do you have any secrets? Uh, I think you can do Docker secret LS. I don't think I have any currently deployed. Oh, I do. Okay, these are some from oh, old demos, yeah. From from old stuff, yeah. But yeah. um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, you can do a Docker secret create and create your secret right there, and that'll and if your context is pointing into uh, ECS, it'll create it on ECS uh, in AWS. Yeah. And if you're pointing local, it'll create a a, a local uh, secret. Um, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Tiago has a question. Will Docker compose without the dash? eventually take the place of Docker dash compose, or will we have both? And if so, what are the difference between the two? Yeah, so eventually the, the plan is to is to refactor uh, Docker dash compose into Docker space compose. So we can uh, give it one uh, DX developer experience. So you don't have to switch between the two. Um, we've done, we've built out all the groundwork. Um, the engineering team has set everything up, set the, the architecture, of the the CLI to support it, and now we're porting things over, um, getting them running. The one of the the uh, our best use cases was the cloud integration with with ECS. Um, yep. So yeah, so it'll it will eventually uh, replace it, you know. But we'll we'll have uh, Docker Compose will be around for a while. Um, you know, I, I can't speak about any kind of end of life or any kind of thing like that. But the idea is to bring it into Docker. Uh, CLI where you can use the commands um, with multiple contexts uh, the same. And if it doesn't make sense, so if you're pointing at ECS right now and you would do a Docker build, um, you'll get a you'll get a message that says uh, this context doesn't support Docker build. And that makes sense because um, ECS doesn't do doesn't do builds, won't build your images, right? Um, so you won't get nasty you won't get nasty errors. The the, the CLI will just tell you, hey. Um, you know that command is not supported with this context. We can try it right now. Yeah, and then you can also to when if you're pointing at um, let's say you're on the your ECS context and you need to build your images, you can do a Docker build and do a Docker space dash dash uh, context, and you can set the context where you want that command to run. And so you can run your builds, and then when the build is finished, you will you will still stay. Um, pointed to your ECS context. So any commands after that will will um will use that. So so I could do it like this. I could do a Docker build and then use my my you know local context, right? Yeah, I think you might have to put that in between the Docker and the build, but give it a shot. I usually put it in between have, Oh I don't have a Docker file actually. It's just a Docker compose. It wouldn't work, but <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but exactly. You do a Docker space dash dash uh, context, set your context, and then what command you want to run. Um, so it makes it easy to to um, to switch your context for that specific command. Yeah. 
while you're typing away, I'll grab a next, uh, the next one. Yeah. Uh, um, so Mario asks, uh, how do you define other AWS services to use in the compose file like RDS? Um, we, we correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jonah. And by the way, I, I'm, you know, defaulting to Jonah on some of these questions because he's working, he's been working on this project with our team and his team for a while. So, um, yeah, so I don't, we don't support RDS yet. Um, you can definitely spin up, um, you know, uh, a database in a container. So I do that all the time with Mongo um, for uh, testing and integration type testing. Um, my personal opinion on running databases in containers in production, I don't advise it. Um, I would use something like RDS or uh, you know, database as a service, um, just because of the operation over overhead and and those type of things. You can do it, but it's yeah. not it's it's not the greatest. But. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely, um, like you mentioned, is not supported. Um, but if you take a look at this blog that Ben wrote in Docker about launching WordPress, he's actually creating it out of band through RDS here, um, and then and then putting that in the compose file, right? And launching right. it. Yeah, I forgot about that. Okay, cool. So you can so so uh, what Jonah's showing there, you can you can definitely have if you have an RDS already up and running, um, yeah, you can absolutely configure your compose to talk to it, right? Uh, and any how your uh, application would connect into your database, whether you're doing that through secrets, environment variables, whatever that is, yeah, you can put those right in compose and it, it will definitely connect. Yeah, yep, definitely. And things like EFS is supposed to give you some long-term retention, but if you are using something like uh like you want long-term like database retention, probably doing like RDS is, is gonna be better than like a container uh of you know MySQL. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um uh, yeah, I, I've made that mistake before and said, Oh, I'll just I'll just run and maintain it. It's not that hard. Yeah, no, um for a production system. <laughs> <laughs> maintaining yeah. your production database and uh, making sure you don't lose data. I already have enough anxiety, Jonah. I don't need any more. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I do, uh, now that we have volumes, uh, ECS support, like Jonah was showing today, I mean, it's huge, right? Uh, to be able to spin up my single Mongo instance and then point point the data files into a volume. And that that's awesome for me. So I can, um, I can share out things that I'm testing. I can share it with a product management team. I can share it with our testing team, right? And then when I spin up and, and it's changing code or, or fixing things and I'm uh, spinning up and tearing down resources, that volume is staying there. So every time I, my single Mongo instance starts up, all the data, all my test data is already there. So I don't have to write scripts to populate my Mongo database. And I don't want to have a you know a standalone service that I need to you know uh, pay for more more you know and all those I don't need all of that for some of the scenarios I'm doing so it's fantastic to do dev integration uh, integration testing those type of things it works great okay is it possible to add configuration for your local machine for example add a my.cnf like you would do for MySQL. So um, I'm wondering if he's talking about uh, sharing, um, sh uh, providing a configuration file for you when MySQL starts up. I would I would really do that inside of your image, um, and you you can then put that configuration file in a volume and read that in from MySQL, right? Or you could do it inside of a custom image. Uh, that you provide all the configuration into, unless you have secrets and those type of things, I wouldn't put them into your image. Um, any thoughts around that, Jonah? I'm not a hundred percent sure of what. It, um, yeah, I. What he's asking. Yeah. I think I might understand. Um, I mean, essentially, right when you create these volumes, the ECS, they're in an EFS, and you're used to Docker Compose being a local volume, right? Um, I guess maybe the closest thing would be mounting the EFS locally and making the changes in there. Um, that, that might be a way you could experience these changes in the cloud, but also have it kind of simulated back to local. Um, right. So you could, have the EF, you could have the EFS that's mounted to your Fargate task, 
but then also mount it locally and be able to you know make changes in it like that would probably be right. the closest thing right i do have um what i've done in the past is i've had an image that is only there to populate a volume um, and so inside the image, when it runs, it then writes to uh, a known location, and then that's stored in my volume. Um, and then I can do a depends on. So the other files that start up that need that configuration file want to read it out of a volume, depend on that earlier image, that earlier container to run and complete. And then all those, uh, that data has been written into my volume and then is shared out with my application images or containers. Um, yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So Dylan Gonzalez asks, uh, I don't think Docker Dash Compose runs on ARM. Um, not not a hundred. Uh, Compose Docker Compose is just a um, is just a tool and doesn't necessarily if it's compiled for the target machine, it'll it'll run on that machine. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, he might be talking about multi-stage builds uh, and uh, multi-architecture builds. So now with Compose, you can you can set environment variables, um, and I forget what they are at the top of my head. So you can tell Compose. Um, I think it's uh, you know Docker use CLI, um, and so Compose used to, uh, Docker Dash Compose uses its own kind of build logic and talks to the engine. Um, and build uh, build kit wasn't supported in Docker Dash Compose yet to do multi architecture builds and those type of things. Um, but now you can set an environment variable in Docker Dash Compose instead of using its kind of internal logic to build. It now delegates that out to the CLI and to the engine. So okay. that's how you can do uh, multi architectural builds using Docker Dash Compose. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, we see a lot of machine learner practitioners and, and people just wanting to test stuff and, and their local machine just can't, you know, do the testing that they wanted to do. So like getting something like this working for EC2 so we can get it working with ARM or Graviton 1, um, you know, would give people like a lot more confidence testing out machine learning jobs and workloads as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think I think that's about it. Um, we're we're over time here. Uh, last cut question I see from Tim is, can you share your social accounts to follow? Yes, you can reach me. I'll put it in the answer at uh, P McKee on Twitter. And I'll send that to everybody. And Jonah, I won't I won't share yours out unless uh, you you can share it if you have it. That's fine. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I um, actually forget your Twitter. I don't, I'm not, I'm not super active. It's just, it's pretty much what my, um, my GitHub is named, but with two J's. Cool. And well, besides that, what, what is the best way for folks to, if they want to read out, reach out to you on the web is, is Twitter the best or, um, yeah. Where, uh, the best to... uh, so, so Twitter works. Um, and the other way is if you have an AWS issue, um, feel free to reach out to us at, AWS developer Slack. So that's uh, the Slack where we would interface with, you know, um, the outside world. <laughs> it's not an internal one, right? So anyone can join Perfect. that. Um, and then also GitHub issues are a great way to talk if, if you have an issue related to a, a certain feature we support or, or work with. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, likewise. So we have a community Slack. Just go to docker.com forward slash community. Um, get on our newsletter. Uh, we don't we won't spam you and never sell your email address, those type of things. Um, but, uh, you know, you get a nice newsletter, keep, keeps you up to date on all the things we're doing, all these, uh, all these webinars and stuff that we're doing. And then um, join our community Slack. Uh, uh, just about every Docker employee is in there. Not, not mandatory, but just they're, they're just at, uh, active in the community um, and answer questions and interact. Uh, that way I'm in there feel free to uh, send me a private message in there uh, and we can chat if you have a couple questions also you can reach me on Twitter and then also connect with me on LinkedIn if you follow me on LinkedIn um, I'm finding a lot of folks nowadays are, are using LinkedIn for for these type of things so uh, feel free to you know follow me on LinkedIn also um, I do give a caveat all the time um, because I do a, a lot of these publicly uh, I will help as much as I possibly can uh, what becomes an issue is it's just hard to answer 
um, help people troubleshoot their specific issues in their environments through Slack or Twitter and those type of things. So just like to set that expectation up front, I will definitely help, definitely answer as many questions and give guidance as, as I can. Um, but when it starts to, to move into more of a support issue, we do, we do have support. So, but no worries, uh, feel free to ask. And if it's just in depth, we'll, we'll take it from there. All right. Awesome. Well, we're over time. Thank you so much, Jonah, for jumping on. I know you and I have been talking about this forever. We definitely, definitely love to have you back. But um, if I don't get to talk to you, you have a great Thanksgiving and great uh, holiday season. Um, and really appreciate you coming on and demoing stuff for us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Peter. And uh, yeah, have uh, some happy holidays and, and maybe we'll see you at reInvent. Awesome, awesome. All right, everybody, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining and uh, look for the, the replay soon. Have a great week.